yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor stunned the American people. 18 ships had been sunk, 170 planes destroyed, and more than 2,000 servicemen killed. The Japanese also attacked key locations in Asia and the Pacific. There seemed to be no way to stop the advancing forces of the rising sun. No matter how long it may take us, to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. President Roosevelt pressed for a way to strike back, and four months after Pearl Harbor, on April 18, 1942, Colonel Jimmy Doolittle led his daring raid on Japan. Sixteen land-based army bombers flew from an aircraft carrier on a mission that had only a slim chance of success. In the bombardier's compartment of plane number 16, Jacob DeShazer, bent on revenge, was flying into history with the Doolittle Raiders, but also into nearly three and a half years of hell on earth as a prisoner of the Japanese. Incredibly, he survived. But the most amazing part of his story is what happened to make him the gentleman who returned to Japan after the war with a message of love and forgiveness for the people he had hated. Jacob DeShazer's extraordinary journey from vengeance to forgiveness. Jake was two years old when his father died. Before his fifth birthday, his mother married a 47-year-old bachelor named Hiram Andrus. When she and her four young children moved to his wheat farm near Madras, Oregon, it was a big change for everyone. A typical day on the farm began with early morning chores, feeding and milking, followed by breakfast together and family worship at the table. And my dad would read a chapter from the Bible then we'd all kneel at our chairs, and my dad and my mother would lead us in prayer. Before school, the children delivered milk to homes in the town of Madras. Everyone in the family worked hard. Jake loved animals, and he was always ready for a little adventure. Jake graduated from high school in 1931 during the Great Depression. There was no money to send him to college or trade school, so he helped on the family farm, and with his brother Glenn, worked odd jobs for neighbors. In 1936, Jake found work in the Surprise Valley of Northern California near Eagleville. For two years, he worked as a camp tender using pack mules to take food and supplies to the Basque sheep herders in the Warner Mountains and the high desert of Nevada. He learned to bake bread in a Dutch oven buried in the coals of a sagebrush fire. For weeks at a time, he would be alone, but he didn't seem to mind. It was a good life, and he was happy to be on his own. He was away from home and choosing his own course. He and Glenn had almost completely quit going to Sunday school and church with us. In Butte Falls, Oregon, Jake tried raising turkeys for a year. But when the price dropped at selling time, he lost everything. At the age of 27, he needed money and a job. So, in February 1940, he joined the Army Air Corps where he trained as an airframe mechanic and later as a bombardier. Assigned to Pendleton Field, Oregon, Jake became a crew member on the Mitchell B-25 bomber. 
In December 1941, he had no idea that events unfolding in the Pacific would change his life forever. He was on KP duty. He was peeling potatoes. And uh, he, s he heard the news on the radio, and he said, those Japanese, they're going to have to pay for this. He was very angry with what they had done. At the same time that uh, the Pearl Harbor attack, attack was going on, plans were being made by the Japanese to attack Guam and the Philippines. The Japanese are running wild. They're, they're, uh, 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 they've, cap they've swept down from uh, Japan, they've captured the Dutch East Indies, they've captured uh, Singapore, the greatest defeat in British history. The Japanese uh, captured these Brits and they treated them bad, 140,000 give or take a few at Singapore. They captured Burma, uh, they were moving down south. The Philippines, McCarthy shall return, he's defeated, you have the death march. They were running wild. President Roosevelt in the White House was extremely upset by the developments that happened out there. And, and he kept asking the Navy and the Air Corps, can't we do something to fight back? We've got to do, uh, retaliate in some way to show that we can and will fight back. Captain Francis Lowe, who was on the staff of Admiral King of the Navy, Chief of Naval Operations, happened to be flying down to Norfolk and he saw some Army bombers taking off from one of the practice fields that the Navy used there near Norfolk that was the same length as a carrier. And he wondered, could Army bombers take off from a carrier? To find out, the Chief of the Army Air Corps called on Colonel Jimmy Doolittle. And he took on the task from General Arnold to find out if a 25, a B-25, or any other model we had would uh, could take off from a carrier. Well, it was an impossible thing, really. You had the B-25s, and you're taking off from an aircraft carrier, and, and no one had ever done anything like this before. I think that Colonel Doodle, to begin with, was the only man that could have done what he did. He was uh, quiet, he was unassuming, he was a very intense listener, and he knew how to persuade people, and rightly so, because he had the ability to figure out things that he needed to do. And uh, he wasn't in the habit of spending a lot of time thinking about things that weren't going to work out. When uh, Jimmy Doolittle was assigned the task to perform this mission, he uh, sat down at a tablet and wrote out the the things that he had to do or had to be done in order to carry it out. My grandfather was a very well-educated man. It's something a lot of people don't know about him. Um, he had a reputation, especially in those early days, as a daredevil. But he actually had his doctorate of science in aeronautical engineering from MIT. In fact, his was the first doctorate issued from MIT in aeronautical engineering. I think the best title that they gave the master of the calculated risk. So he made a risk and he calculated how to do it and he mastered it. And uh, figured that the, if the carrier could get a plane load of B-25s to within 450 miles of Japan, that the aircraft could then be flown, bomb targets in, in five cities in Japan, and then proceed to China to a safe landing strip in, the, in China. When the squadrons had moved to Columbia, South Carolina, he sent out the word he wanted volunteers for a very dangerous mission. He didn't say where we were going or anything about that, but he just said that he had a, had a job to perform. Almost the whole group volunteered. I think it was mainly because the living conditions weren't that good. <laughs> they didn't get the heck out of here. <laughs> And then my dad was one of the last ones, and he, he was planning on saying no the whole time. But by the time everybody was saying yes, he said he was too chicken to say no. Everything was dangerous in those days. Uh, 
war had been declared and uh, the whole process of uh, living was, uh, you were in danger to go somewhere wherever you went. And I couldn't think of anything better than to go with somebody as uh, capable as General Doolittle. At Eglin Field, Florida, the B-25s were modified with extra fuel tanks to increase their range, while the crews trained for a mission so secret, even they didn't know what it was. I don't think we understood what our mission was, except that we were gonna to go to the Far East. We just didn't talk about that. We just talked about the fact that we had to get ready and to get the airplanes ready, and to do a certain thing with the airplanes. One of them was to take it off in the short distance, and the other was to fly it as far as it would go. The most difficult part of the takeoff was not to get the nose too high because you would drag the tail, and that would uh, decelerate the aircraft to the point of you couldn't get off in the required uh, short distance. We had approximately 400 feet. The B-25 uh, carried five crew members. It had the pilot, and then the co-pilot, the navigator, the bombardier, and uh, a uh, gunner for the top turret. Our bombardier, uh, of course, was up in front, and since we were flying low level, we had a, a Ross Greening, one of the pilots, developed a small aluminum uh, angle affair that uh, he could use as a bomb site. It cost uh, 25 cents. And that's what every bombardier used uh, on the mission. Because of the more amount of plexiglass around him, the bombardier was uh, more exposed than the rest of the crews. Of course, if you're getting shot at, why the, everybody's in an exposed position. After three weeks of training at Eglin Field, the crews were ordered to fly their planes to California, where 16 B-25s were loaded onto the aircraft carrier Hornet. They sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge on the night of April 1st, 1942. After we boarded the carrier and were two days out to sea, uh, the Captain uh, Mishner came on a PA system and said this force is bound for Tokyo. The Hornet was joined by a task force of ships, including the aircraft carrier Enterprise, the flagship of Admiral William F. Halsey. Together, they sailed toward Japan. The aircraft commanders were briefed on the five Japanese cities where they would drop their bombs. Then, they selected their targets naval facilities, fuel storage tanks, factories, and warehouses. We had uh, four bombs, 500-pound bombs, two 500-pound high explosives, and two fire bombs. The aircraft were then to proceed to a base in China, near Chuchao, and would be refueled and then flown to Chongqing. But as we know now, of course, the mission did not go as planned. Although the carrier was to try to get the aircraft within 450 miles of Japan, they were discovered about 650 miles out by a picket boat. The thing that most uh, all of us heard that woke us up was the cruisers immediately opened up uh, and sunk the, the uh, picket ship, and uh, I, that. Got everybody ready for breakfast, I think. After they sunk the picket ship, they announced for the Army people to man their planes. So the only thing to do then was grab your B-4 bag and uh, head for the airplane. So Doolittle decided they, go, they would go, and Halsey gave them the order to go. So the B-25 started their takeoffs, and Doolittle was first. He was just a leader. 
didn't say follow me, he just went and you went. You wanted to go with him and do what he said. Colonel Doolittle ran the engines up to full max power. I put down the full flaps and opened up the cow flaps on the engine. At that point, we were ready to go. The deck officer waited until we came up on kind of a crest of a wave, and then he gave us a signal to start rolling. And by the time we got to where we were about ready to break ground, the ship itself dropped out from underneath it, and uh, we were airborne. The fellows that followed them, when they saw the old man go off, they knew they could make it, but of course a lot of them had doubts. And, uh, but one by one, they took off. We were number 16. The first aircraft was off at 8.20 a.m. when we were one hour later at 9.20 a.m., 60 minutes between number one and number 16. Well, Bill Farrow was pilot, I was co-pilot. George Barr was navigator, and uh, Harold Spatz was, uh, was engineer. Then uh, Jake DeShazer was uh, bombardier. We just uh, wondered if everybody was gonna make it, and uh, everybody in front of us made it, so we were positive that we could make it. Well, we went individually, we didn't uh, didn't have contact with anybody. We took off individually and just made our way to where we were supposed to go without reference to anybody else. We thought uh, we would probably be welcomed with a, quite a bit of uh, enemy activity, but fortunately, uh, at high noon, which we arrived there, uh, they had just finished an air raid exercise. And uh, I believe that helped us. We did run into an aircraft, uh, which was active, but it wasn't uh, accurate. It jostled us around a bit. We were on our own. We had no contact with anybody. The only thing we could do was listen to radio stations that uh, were broadcasting for direction, ADF. We were without radio contact. We flew. Uh, between 100 and 200 feet on the whole mission, uh, except for the bombing run, which was uh, like the book says, 30 seconds. We pulled up to 1,500 feet and dropped the bombs. After the bombing mission run, we went back down on the deck and flew uh, maybe 100 miles south of Japan and then turned southwest and flew along the chain uh, at low level and arrived over China at dust. Uh, they had planned to have a homing station at Chuchao, which is our uh, place where we were supposed to land and gas up. And uh, it was never, it, it never arrived. Uh, the weather was bad. We had no place to land. Uh, and also, uh, the Chinese heard uh, our engine, and they thought it was a Japanese air raid, and they turned off all the electricity. So we were at 9,000 feet uh, running out of fuel, and the only thing to do was fly until you ran out of fuel and bail out. Well, it was 14 hours or more after we'd left the carrier, and the airplane just stopped. It engines quit so the crew bailed out and I followed them. At the time when we bailed out it was we were in instrument conditions and it was raining and real foggy and and it was some kind of experience. We bailed out from about 8,000 feet. All of us landed in different parts of rice paddies and I fractured my ankle as I my right ankle and uh, I had a hard time walking. Of the 16 planes that carried out the raid, one flew to Russia, two ditched off the Chinese coast, one crash landed safely, and the other crews bailed out over China. Three of the raiders died that night from injuries. The next morning, those who survived began walking, most of them alone. 
there was a, I don't know whether it was a soldier or what he was, he didn't have any kind of uniform. Or, but, uh, it turned out, I guess, he was a gorilla. And we went to some distance to another building and walked in and uh, there was Colonel Doolittle. Uh, I said, boy, am I glad to see you. <laughs> Many friendly Chinese civilians risked their lives to help the raiders reach safety. We cannot travel on the open road because that road is being patrolled by the Japanese. So we can only take the back road, the mountain trails. So that's difficult. Only can travel a short distance each day. So that way, it took us about 10, 11 days from the point he crash landed. But Japanese troops controlled much of China, and they were searching for the American flyers who had bombed their country. There was a Chinese uh, at this little house and uh, a male Chinese, and he came out and greeted me and said, I, friend, and uh, I'm Chinese, and he said, I speak English a little. And uh, so I said, man, this is really great. I've got it made. <laughs> Just as we approached the house, there was about 15 Japanese came out from behind the house with bayoneted rifles. Finally, one of the ranking officers came in and said, that I was a prisoner of war of the Japanese. <laughs> Colonel Doolittle felt uh, that uh, he was going to be court-martialed uh, because all the airplanes were lost and uh, he couldn't account for all the crews. And uh, at one point in time, uh, he was very dejected. But the audacious part of it is that that we had to do something, and they came up with this concept and idea, and my gosh, it worked. I mean, I, I think that to take off from an aircraft carrier uh, to see and do this was quite a feat back there in 1942, and to bomb the Japanese homeland, and many aspects, it didn't do much, but it did a lot, because what it did was, it scared the Japanese, because uh, uh, Yamamoto and the Japanese staff had told the emperor they'll never hit us. Colonel Doolittle didn't want to leave uh, till he could account for all of the people and also to try and persuade the Chinese to uh, uh, do as much, give them as much help as they could. Uh, he even offered a reward money if they could uh, get uh, some of the crews that were captured. When we started moving, it took about 10 days to, uh, we moved by walking, just about every means of transportation. Seating chairs, donkeys, rickshaws, and buses and trucks. Well, Madam Shanghai Shek was our sponsor and we, uh, we just kind of fit in. She took care of us and arranged everything for us. And, uh, Got, got us all cleaned up, got us clean clothes, and, and then got us away out of uh, Chongqing to uh, eventually to New Delhi. But anyway, we came back home and went, went our way, went back to our families. That was in uh, May or June. And on the 8th of September, I was in England on my way back to war. But there were eight raiders that Jimmy Doolittle could not find. All five crew members of Plane 16 had been captured by the Japanese, along with three from Plane Number 6. Some were men of strong faith, but Corporal Jacob DeShazer was far away from God. His heart was filled with hatred for the Japanese, and now he was in their hands. In the weeks to come, he would face torture and malnutrition, then endure endless months of solitary confinement. After two years of captivity, 
Jake DeShazer and his fellow prisoners were given some books to read, and one of them was a Bible, a book he had turned away from as a young man. In what seemed to be the most God-forsaken place on earth, he would discover the truth of these words. On April 18, 1942, Colonel Jimmy Doolittle led a daring surprise raid on Japan. After hitting targets in five cities, his B-25 bombers ran out of fuel over China, forcing the crews to bail out or crash land. While most of them made it to safety in Chongqing, eight airmen were captured by the Japanese. Jake DeShazer was one of them. After being held briefly in China, they were flown to Tokyo. It was the beginning of a long journey from which half of them would not return. The military police uh, interrogated us for, oh, I imagine 15 days, day and night, without sleep or anything, you know. and. Uh, they had all five of my crew were captured, of course, and uh, three others from uh, crew number six. They would hold us down and pour water down our nose, that sort of thing. They tried everything, I guess, and uh, would make threatening gestures and all of that. They were tortured, they were starved, they were put in solitary confinement. They were beaten, they were kicked, they were done about everything you can think of to somebody. And they treated their prisoners awful because in the Japanese society, a prisoner was the worst. You die as a warrior. Japanese soldiers believed it was better to die than surrender. They would fight to the death or commit suicide before being captured. It was the way of honor get captured is bad, and so they treated their prisoners much worse, frankly, than the Germans did. So they beat them, and they tortured them, and they, they, they kicked them around, and they didn't get, very few people lived. A month after the raid, Jimmy Doolittle was promoted to Brigadier General and received the Congressional Medal of Honor from President Roosevelt. My grandfather never felt he deserved that. He never felt he earned it. So in his heart and his mind, and he told President Roosevelt that medal belonged to all of the Raiders, to Jake, to Bobby, to everybody. That same day, the Raiders who had returned to the United States received the Distinguished Flying Cross in ceremonies at Bowling Field. And for the first time, the American public heard news of the Doolittle Raid. Militarily, the raid had a great psychological effect. Negative on the Japanese. They were infuriated that they had been attacked. We were exhilarated by the whole thing happening. And the news was released. It was just the greatest news that any of us could have had, any American could have had. On May 21st, Jake's mother received a telegram from the mayor of Pendleton, Oregon, inviting her to attend a celebration for the Raiders who trained there. She wired back, We'll be glad to come if my boy is there. Please wire collect whether or not he is. The mayor replied, Your boy will not be here. Although there was no official mention that eight men were prisoners of the Japanese, Jimmy Doolittle knew, and he was pursuing every military and diplomatic means to find them. He would never stop looking for his men who were left behind. The Shays and that gang 
took a real hit. I mean, they were punished bad, beaten and tortured and, and starved and uh, humiliated. They were interrogated hours on end. And uh, they, the treatment was just uh, inhumane. After weeks of questioning and deprivation, the eight men signed personal history statements written in Japanese. These would later be used against them as confessions of war crimes against the Japanese people during the raid. From Tokyo, they were taken to a military prison in Shanghai and placed in a common cell. Exhausted by dysentery and malnutrition, they were at a low ebb when Lieutenant Chase Nielsen rallied their spirits. Chase was a, was a tough guy. He's the one in prison who said uh, when they feed it, when he got some rice and it was full of worms, and the other guys threw the stuff back at, at the Japanese and kicked it around the cell. They weren't going to eat that stuff. He looked at it and he says, those little things have got protein in them. I'm going to eat them because I'm coming back to tell them what these people are doing to us. In August 1942, the eight Americans were moved to a maximum security prison outside Shanghai. Before a military court, whose proceedings were all in Japanese, they were tried and convicted of crimes against humanity for their part in the Doolittle Raid. And they'd accuse us of bombing and strafing uh, civilian areas and stuff. So that was her so-called uh, court-martial. They were classified as war criminals and sentenced to death. Two months later, Lieutenants Bill Farrow and Dean Hallmark, along with Sergeant Harold Spatz, were brought before a Japanese firing squad. We thought we were going to all be executed, but they reprieved uh, us to life imprisonment with special treatment that if they won the war, we'd be kept as slave labor. If we won the war, we'd be shot. That was the final court martial. We really did not know what happened to them. Didn't know where they were. There was no way that the word could have gotten out because they were in Japanese prisons in China. And uh, the security was very tight, especially for them. Sometimes while Jake was a prisoner, my mother and father would sit down to eat and as was customary, would bow their heads in prayer. And my dad would say, so they told me, I wonder if Jake has anything to eat. And he said that it often resulted in nobody eating. But they did take me to that movie, and so it became clear to me and then I I sensed my mother's grieving yeah sense of sorrow for her brother months on end months on end and uh, prayers constantly yeah, yeah we were prisoners for 40 months and 36 of Oh, those months were in solitary confinement. So solitary confinement was uh, something that took uh, maybe all of the time we were in solitary confinement to get used to. <laughs> it was a pretty uh, weird feeling. Boredom, being isolated, being in cells all by yourself and uh, eating rats and bugs and, and uh, getting kicked around and not being able to talk to each other. To sit in a cell by yourself 
staring at a wall. You can't see outside. There might be windows up there about eight feet high that you can't see out of. All you know is whether maybe it's day or night, and that's all you know. And sit there and stare at the wall for hours at a time. What happens to your mind? What do you do with the time? You remember uh, back to your childhood days and every, every, nearly every occasion in life that meant anything to you, you know, you spend time thinking in that manner. When a Japanese photograph appeared in Time magazine, Jake's family was startled. His brother Glenn said, that's Jake all right, and he looks mad. But they did not know that the photo had been taken a year before, and that two of the men shown had been executed. The remaining five raiders had been secretly moved to a military prison in Nanking. There, on December 1st, 1943, Lieutenant Robert Meter died from beriberi and malnutrition. He had been uh, ill and kind of hurting for several days. And, and uh, we got outside to exercise, you know, about 10 or 15 minutes a day. We kind of helped him get back in his cell. And uh, one of the guards kind of pushed him and he said, hey, as weak as I am, I can still beat your butt. <laughs> and, but he was, and we were helping him and, you know, he was a great guy. Uh, the Japanese uh, took us into his cell and let us pass by his casket. They had him in a wooden box. And then afterwards they cremated him. And uh, his box got back home. And uh, the ones that were executed, we got their ashes also in the end. Meter's death concerned the Japanese prison officers who ordered improved treatment for the remaining four. They received an extra blanket, better food, and something they had longed for, books. One of those books was a Bible. And all four of them were allowed to read the Bible, but they were allowed to keep it only about three weeks maximum and pass it on to another one. But the Bible affected every one of those four men. And I think that that uh, was a turning point for each of them. The 23rd Psalm was a, a pretty good starting point. But we tried to read the whole Bible through. And of course, the Gospels were the important thing. Jake was deeply impressed with the words of Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. On June 8, 1944, Jake bowed his head and spoke to God. Lord, you know all things. You know I do repent of my sins. Even though I am far from home, and though I am in prison, I must have forgiveness. Jake uh, had been a, his family had been Christians, but he was a disbeliever until he got that Bible, and he, he read that Bible, and really, I guess the Holy Spirit just took over his life, his whole thinking. So it was a kind of a, terrific uh, meaning to me at the time because we had at outside at exercise we had both confided that we had really believed in the Lord Jesus. The summer of 1944 was the hottest on record in Nanking and the following winter was the coldest. On Christmas Day the four raiders were jubilant when American planes bombed an oil refinery nearby. But the planes did not come back, and life returned to month after month of boredom and monotony. Then, in June 1945, 
they were abruptly moved to a prison in Peking. So we were blindfolded and handcuffed and leg cuffed and everything, and uh, they carried us by train, and they had two guards per person. Alone in small cells, each man was forced to sit on a narrow stool and face the wall. They had no news of the outside world to tell them why their situation had become worse or that things were about to change dramatically. When the guards were occupied, Jake and Bobby Height could communicate briefly by talking through the Benjo, a common receptacle toilet shared by their adjoining cells. We would take the lid off and yell through the, to one another. And I said, Jake, what was the matter? And he said, Bobby, I was praying this morning and the war's gonna be over today. He said it was revealed to me. I think it was uh, the 9th of August. Uh, the Japanese were asking funny questions and doing kind of funny things. And I think it was on the 13th and 14th, they gave us shave and haircut and all of that. And that was a little bit unusual. And they were just acting a, uh, not normal. You know, the normal routine of coming by ourselves and checking us. On the 17th of August, a seven-man OSS team parachuted into a Japanese airfield near Peking. Their mission was to accept the surrender of the Japanese and to be sure that all prisoners of war in that area were released. Their translator was Dick Hamada, a Japanese-American from Hawaii. The two little Tokyo Raiders were prisoners and it so happened that when we parachuted, they were in Peking. So we were really concerned about what was gonna to happen to us. We thought they were, well, they're gonna shoot us. And on the 20th, uh, they knocked on our cell doors and said, okay, we're gonna, they took us all out and uh, said, uh, we're gonna let you go home because our hearts are so kind. <laughs> They were released to Major Ray Nichols and three officers of the OSS team. After 40 months as prisoners of war, it all seemed like a dream. So they put us on the back of a truck and carried us to a hotel and that's where they had other people that had been prisoners of the Japanese. And uh, we found out that we were actually free and the Japanese said, uh, surrendered. They were all skinny, underfed like, you know, but they were healthy except for Lieutenant George Bow who could not walk. He was, he was really ill. The first meal we had after we got out of prison camp, when we got in the Hotel de Gink in Peking, the British prisoners in there had picked up some Irish stew. And I'm telling you, that was mighty good too. On the Night, night before their departure, we invited all the prisoners to join us in a little party. We had pie, we had cake, we had milk, we had everything. I'll never forget it. It was kind of a, a joyful thing to know that really we were going to get to return. They were flown to Chongqing in western China where an armed forces radio reporter discovered that Jake had not lost his sense of humor. Hello, Corporal. Hello, I'm sergeant now. You're a sergeant now. My, my, my error. It's a long, hard way to make sergeant, but I finally made it. <laughs> From Walter Reed Hospital, Jake wrote to his parents, quote, God spoke to me when I was in solitary confinement, and I want to go to a missionary school and go back and help the Oriental people when I get a good education. I learned to pray and obey God in solitary cells. It was long enough to learn how to think. I'm truly thankful for every prayer you have prayed for me and for all your care and patience and forgiveness. He 
soon told us that he intended to go back to Japan as a missionary. And that was quite amazing. Six weeks after Jake's return, he was out of the Army and enrolled at Seattle Pacific College. Going from prison to the classroom was quite an adjustment itself, but people wanted to hear his story of captivity and conversion to Christ. Every weekend, he spoke in a church or auditorium with overflow crowds. They had him at Youth for Christ, and he appeared during the program, very thin man, halting speech because he'd been in confinement so long. And uh, they interviewed him. For what he'd been through, I think he surprised him, surprised us all with his response to any question that was given to him. And that was kind of typical of Jake. I think he surprised a lot of people in his presentations. Jake was serious about his education, but he soon noticed Florence Matheny from Toddville, Iowa a former teacher who wanted to be a missionary. Florence is a person who was always ready with a smile, always positive, jolly, ready for a joke, and a great, great talker. So we made a good pair because we both like to talk. We came to school in 1945, and that's when I first knew him. His Diction wasn't very good yet. He talked in a monotone because he'd been in solitary confinement for so long. Well, he was skinny and, he, and his hair was all chopped off. Uh, but I thought he's, he's headed the right direction. We didn't date at first, but we knew each other through different organizations and chapel and so forth. After his first date with Florence, it was almost understood that they, they were made for each other and they really belonged to each other. And our first date was May of that year, May 1st. We went to Youth for Christ. And uh, we were engaged in June and married in August all in that year. But we were older, you know. We didn't have any time to waste. And no matter where they went, it seemed there was a reporter with a camera. As far as the press is concerned, once they heard of this story and, uh, and the change that had come about Jake, they were interested in everything that he did. I never once saw Jake's head turned by any attention that was paid to him. He was, the, the one thing that I remember most about Jake was his humility. In December 1948, Jake, Florence, and 14-month-old Paul boarded a ship for Japan. They were young, inexperienced, and somewhat apprehensive about what lay ahead. Yet they were guided by the words of Jesus to love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who persecute you. I'm sure there were some people who couldn't figure it out, didn't make sense, that he would want to go back to Japan. But there are some people that understood. They understood why he was going back what motivated him, what he was going to say when he got there. He was going to let the people know that he loved them, and most of all, Jesus loved them. Jake's sincerity and commitment showed that his experience in prison had been far more than foxhole religion. While he was a prisoner, that he had the vision that uh, this was what he was supposed to do. And uh, he, he did it and he never budged. He just stayed Jake and came back and went to divinity school and then was convinced that his 
duty was to go back and preach the gospel to the Japanese, and he did that. So, you know, he had the right thoughts and the right uh, idea and was led by the right one. <laughs> and from hatred, when Pearl Harbor was a bomb, he had vengeance in his heart. But when he spoke to God in prison, all that went away. And instead of hatred came love and pity. And uh, it's amazing how a man can change from hatred to love. And uh, God has his way. You know, God always does the right thing. He didn't feel like he had the strength or the talent to do the things that God called him to do. And all he could do was tell God, I'll try, and you'll have to do the rest. And um, uh, so out of that weakness, I think that um, God grew strength because of Dad's willingness to try. Jake DeShazer spent 40 months as a prisoner of the Japanese during World War II. After his release, he spent the next 40 months training to become a missionary. When he and his wife Florence boarded a ship in December 1948, they looked forward to bringing a message of Christian love and hope to America's former enemy. But Japan still suffered the physical and emotional pain of lives lost and cities destroyed. How would the Japanese people receive an American airman who had bombed their country? Japan was bombed to Smithville Marines. I mean, we, we had those firebomb raids. I mean, these were really, uh, if you want to talk about it, inhumane. Uh, the firebomb raids on Tokyo, 100,000 people died in March uh, uh, of, of 1945, the end of it. We were bombing these people at will. Uh, the towns were destroyed, the, the infrastructure was down, the people had been humiliated. 6日の朝学校に行った時に the morning of August 6th, when I was 14 years old, I went to school. Suddenly there was this bright flash of light and a huge explosion. We didn't know what it was. Later, some of my relatives from Hiroshima came to our house and at that time I heard the story for the first time. About a month later, we went into the city and we saw that everything was burned and destroyed. I cannot express my feeling. Everything was so terrible. Yes, emotionally defeated the loss, so to say, and uh, spiritually vacant. How to survive? We didn't have uh, enough food. So we are both very hungry, uh, both in the uh, uh, physical dimension and the spiritual dimension. So no at us, uh, at noon on August 15th, we heard the voice of our emperor on the radio. It was a declaration of defeat. We could scarcely understand the meaning of what he said. Our teacher explained to us that Japan had lost to the United States and the war had ended. We were very disturbed. All my uh, hope for the future as a young man really, really was shattered uh, completely because uh, yeah, we were educated and trained uh, to die for the country and also as for the emperor is the uh, most honorable things to do. But the, uh, when war ended, that hope is gone. So it was a real emptiness of vanity feelings. Some of them had been through such awful experiences, not only the bombings, but they ran out of food and 
and they were poor. The people were poor. People that had been rich were poor, and it was a very hard time for them. To see Japan in 45, no idea. No, I, Americans today, I would say 99.9% .9 would have no idea that Japan was ever like it was in 1945. After the war, many people, especially students, were very confused when we heard that everything we had been taught up till now was not true. We had to think, how could we live after this? As we approached Japan and we saw the dark houses and it, none of them painted, you know, all just real dark and everything, and then we started getting kind of scared because even though you've You've studied missions in college and so on. You don't know what you're gonna face. And of course, we didn't know very much of the language. And so we were scared and we didn't know exactly what kind of work we're gonna be doing even. In the months before the DeShazers arrived, more than a million leaflets telling Jake's story were handed out across Japan. When the ship docked in Yokohama, they were met by Japanese members of the Free Methodist Church and by a large group of reporters. There was about 40 newspaper men there, and they hollered, uh, is Jake DeShazer here? And he said, I am. They said, go back in the dining room, we want to talk to you. And they got around a big table and interviewed him. They asked him why he came back to Japan. And he said, well, I came to tell him about Jesus because you newspaper men know a lot of news, but you don't know the news that happened 2,000 years ago. I thought I better bring him up to date, he said. Well, he arrives in Yokohama, and, and it's a story. It's a story of here's a guy, and they couldn't understand this, that had been beaten up. Uh, they knew the story of the Doolittle Raiders, and here's a guy that comes back and says, I love you. And they couldn't understand this. So for about six months, there was something in the newspaper about him or, or about us. There was just a lot of publicity. It wasn't long before Jake's initial work in Japan became clear. Letters came from all over wanting him to come and tell his story. And I remember we had a big cardboard box in the, in the middle of the floor, and it was just full of these letters. And we couldn't read them. And uh, so we didn't know what to do. But Brother Oda, who uh, was the head of our church in Japan at that time, came and he said, I'll take care of them. And he said, you have a story to tell, and I'll go with you and help you. It was more important for people to hear his message than for him to prepare himself in language study. One of the very best interpreters in Japan, a man named Mr. Oda, was uh, with Jake constantly and interpreting for him in, in meetings that were attended by thousands of people. He was president of the college, and superintendent of our mission over there and he just gave all that up to go with Jake for six years. Jake didn't try to be complicated. He just automatically was simple in his approach. He usually tell a story about a time in prison but he didn't dramatize or anything like that. But he, the Japanese knew what he'd been through. I saw a poster in front of a big house near my home, and the poster announced a meeting where DeShazer was going to speak. I was very interested in his story because he was once a soldier who came to Japan to bomb. I was a soldier who fired the anti-aircraft gun, so I decided to attend the meeting. In the preaching, DeShazer quoted Jesus, who said, Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing. It made a big impression on me, and I repented that evening and believed in Jesus Christ. They could tell with Jake that he was what he said, that he was real. You give it his own language, you it tell you the truth. There's nothing fake about Jake, that's right. He was very busy. He usually preached two or three times a day, sometimes more. And he went from one end of Japan to the other. 
He had meetings in coal mines. He ministered in hospitals and jails and on the street corner and uh, in churches and in schools and everywhere. At the beginning part of their marriage, he had to be gone quite a bit. <clears throat> and she was home raising the children and taking care of a lot of things in the house and running the Bible studies and the English classes. He'd be away for a week or two a lot of the time. And one summer, he was gone all summer except for one week. And uh, we had one week vacation. And uh, that's all I saw him all summer. Friends had to uh, stay home. And uh, actually, uh, she began the Bible class here. There was a man who let us use his house because he didn't want to pay taxes on it. Upstairs, it had a great big room like a dance floor. And uh, so uh, while Jake was gone, I started a church there. The Bible class uh, is the beginning of uh, this church. As junior high students, we both always looked forward very much to going to the DeShazer's house, so much that we almost stumbled hurrying to get there. We still remember what a happy time we had there. Even though we had to carry our huge Bibles with us, we enjoyed going there very much. She was a very cheerful person with a pretty smile. I can still remember that she always used to move her head back and laugh with a loud voice. She was very good at cooking. She would bake cakes and make cookies, and she treated us with tea. At that time in Japan, we had very limited food, so we enjoyed it very much. When Jake was home, he often practiced his Japanese by speaking in church without an interpreter. The congregation was very kind. <laughs> this is difficult to say, but if I were to grade him, I'd give him about 70 points and his wife about 80. His wife was better at Japanese than he was. There was something in Reverend DeShazer's life that was different from other people. I felt like he wanted to share Jesus, who lived inside him, with the Japanese people. On Christmas Day, 1951, seven people were baptized by Jake. The group included Yukiko Miyuda, Aiko Miyuda, and Shoji Tanaka. It was their expression of commitment to follow Christ alone. Uh, the country was ripe for some sort of Christianity, but it was also ripe for communism, and it was in disarray. After the war, many Japanese were seeking a new philosophy of life. At that time, Christian teachers gave good answers to us. So many, many Japanese became a Christian, and I'm one of them. In Japanese society, ancestors are revered and ceremonial worship to ensure their continuing happiness is a sacred responsibility. <laughs> to become a follower of Jesus violated this deeply held value and brought disgrace to the family. In most cases, it meant being cut off from all ties with parents and home. When I became a Christian and baptized, I was actually they kicked it off, cut it off all the family relationship. If you go your own ways, go ahead. So I decided to follow Christ. You know, it was a hard decision. You say I love my parents and the families. You know, they loved me, but when you really follow Christ, sometimes you have to say no. This is the way I go. When Stephen and Evangeline Hattori married, Jake and Florence served as their go-between, an important role usually played by parents in Japan. She was very kind. Let me wear her wedding dress. I thought that was a wonderful thing to do. 
During the early 1950s, Jake had many unique opportunities. He was reunited with two of his former guards who had been kind to him in the Nanking prison. He led an English Bible class in a Buddhist high school. He became honorary president of a girls' business college. And he always took a special interest in those who faced difficult challenges in life. In April 1950, a remarkable thing happened. My father's name is Mitsuo Fuchida. And most of people in Japan remember him as a um, leader of the Pearl Harbor attack. He led a 360 airplane for that. You know, my father wasn't home uh, many times. Only he, I remember him, it's like a ship comes in a port. Sometimes we do a uh, uh, walk, maybe are going to store, or I don't, I don't remember exactly what. But then some people recognize him and they salute him. I think they treat him well during the war because he's a hero. During the war, yeah, we are winning uh, at the beginning and everybody thought it's pretty good. It's more like he's a god. But in those days, after the war, it wasn't. And people like Fuchida and Genda, who had been big dogs in the military, now were wondering. He didn't have any work. So that's why he bought a piece of land and started uh, farming. That's the time he taught us uh, children survival technique. If you don't have a water, you dig the well. So we did. Uh, Fuchita becomes an egg farmer, a chicken farmer. He's looking for something, some sort of, of structure. Then one day, he found a pamphlet of Jacob de Chaser. I was a prisoner of Japan. And then he started to read that. Captain Fuchita bought a Bible, and like Jake and so many others, the words of Jesus from the cross touched his heart. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. A few weeks after Fuchida's conversion, he and Jake shared the platform in Osaka's largest auditorium. The two former enemies told an overflow audience of several thousand how Christ had made them brothers and friends. Especially in Japan, many people doubted why he became a Christian. That's just for namesake, to uh, save the uh, family, to, uh, you know, for financial or whatever the reason is. But after, when he becomes more and more taking time, he is really getting more and more that way, yeah sincere. Furlough often meant being the missionary family at summer camp meetings. And she would get us kids up on stage and she would have us sing little songs. And she would have these rice bowls and she would have chopsticks and say, and this is the way you eat rice with chopsticks and this is, and then she'd have us speak some Japanese. Do you want to hear a Japanese tongue twister? Is tonari no kyaku wa yoku kakiku kyaku da minna mo momo mo momo no uchi. I don't know, most of the time, it kind of turned into a giggle session. I don't think us kids were really crazy about doing that. When Jake and Florence returned to Japan in 1959, they found dramatic changes. Economic prosperity had replaced the former sense of spiritual need. The crowds no longer came to hear Jake's story, so they changed their approach. Our Japanese leaders called Jake in and they said, Jake, you bombed Nagoya during the war, so we think that you should go back to Nagoya 
and start a church there. Their next door neighbor, Mr. Iwata, clearly remembered the Doolittle Raid on Nagoya. I was still in school, and it was during club activity, so I was in the classroom. We suddenly heard an engine noise, and we all said, what is that? But we didn't see the plane. But the guys who were out on the exercise field, they saw the aircraft and also the faces of the bomber crew. Everybody said, those were American planes. They had American markings on the aircraft. Nobody expected the American planes would come so soon to Japan. I didn't expect that at all. Well, I love that time in Nagoya because our whole family, that was the only time our whole family was together. And uh, it was more of a family ministry. We would go out all over the neighborhood and we would play hard and then um, we would tell all of our friends, hey, you should come to our house on Sunday morning because my mom would set up Sunday school. So we'd, we'd sing little English songs and my mom would would teach them, and then the parents started gradually coming, and my dad would start preaching a sermon, and next thing you know, we were having church. But it was very, very informal. And that's where dad would set the table out, and, and you know, we'd set up a chairs for everybody and everything, and that's where we started our services, was in our home. <laughs> It was a terrible storm, so we could not sleep all night. The Shazer and his family told me that they were at peace during the storm because they were Christians. No matter how bad the storm was, they had peace. I was really deeply impressed by that. Their family was very close to us and we were good neighbors. They told us that they were praying for us, so we started to attend the meetings. The first time he came to Japan, he brought bombs, but the second time he came, he brought God's Word, and he dropped the love of God. My dad absolutely loved Japanese people. It was not something he had to work at. When Jake prayed for forgiveness in that Japanese prison and asked to be able to forgive his enemies, the Lord gave him an unconditional love. He appreciated the beauty and culture of Japan, and he longed to show them the way of Christ, his forgiveness, and love. Their focus was always on people, making friends, building relationships, helping others, and sharing the most important thing they had, their faith in Christ. During 30 years of service in Japan, Jake and Florence started three churches in their home and helped plant 20 others. In 1977, they retired. He retired from being a missionary, but I don't think he ever retired from being, a, I guess, a soldier. And just being out there and making sure that the message was still getting out there, and as long as anybody was interested in it, uh, he was willing to share it. Retirement also gave Jake time to attend the annual Doolittle Raider reunions. We always have a whoever gone. And the He didn't act like he was a celebrity. He didn't act like he was all that important. He was a very humble man. I think he felt that God was the one that was important and that's who he wanted to keep out front. I've always kind of uh, felt like that 
really that the Lord used Jake to speak to maybe all of us. Maybe that's the word, that he uh, exuded truth. You looked at Jake and you thought, oh great, there's a, there's a, there's a whole man. Yeah, I can, I can, I can believe him. When my dad was telling his story, it was never about him. It's always been about God and, and uh, uh, wanting people to get right with God and, and serve the Lord. And uh, it's never been about him. It was the forgiveness that God put in his heart. Uh, just, uh, it was supernatural. It wasn't, uh, that, that can't be faked. My mom was also just as dedicated, and I think it was just as important to her. Um, she may not have had the national story of the Doolittle Raid and everything like that, but uh, in her own way, she uh, was as strong as he was. One of Jake DeShazer's favorite phrases is from 1 Corinthians 13, love never fails. And that's how he often signs letters or books. He always says that love is really the best way that if you're in a situation and you don't know what to do, try to figure out the most loving response and choose that. And he says, 10 times out of 10, that will be the right choice in any difficult situation. He realized, you know, God will help you if you make the first step toward loving your enemies. <laughs> <laughs>